Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Jillian Kemsley, a senior editor at CNEN, and I will be moderating today's event. This webinar is titled Solid Phase Extraction 101 and is being sponsored by Horizon Technology. CNEN works with sponsors to identify topics of interest and value to CNEN's audience and that are consistent with CNEN's mission to provide news and analysis of the chemistry enterprise in a timely, accurate, and balanced fashion. During the webinar, you can adjust the size of the slides on your screen by grabbing the lower right corner with your mouse. If you need technical assistance, please look at the Help widget at the bottom of the screen or type your query into the Q&A box. If you are disconnected during the webcast, please log in again according to the instructions you received earlier. You are encouraged to contribute to the success of this webinar by asking questions at any time during the presentation through the Q&A box on your screen. The questions will be answered at the end of the presentation, and as your moderator, I will pose as many as time permits. Please note that CNEN does not endorse any company, products, or services that may be mentioned in the webinars. Each webinar will be archived at CNEN online after the live webcast. Today's presentation is being sponsored by Horizon Technology. Headquartered in Salem, New Hampshire, Horizon Technology manufactures automated sample preparation systems for analysis of organic compounds in aqueous samples and oil and grease testing. Analytes include semi-volatile organics, diesel range organics, total petroleum hydrocarbons, pesticides, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, explosives, pharmaceutical byproducts, and personal care products. During the presentation, we will hear from Robert Johnson, who founded Horizon Technology in 1993 with his wife, Martha. Bob now serves as the company's chairman and chief technical officer. Prior to founding Horizon, Bob worked for Zymark and Varian. And I will now hand over to Bob to begin the presentation. Thank you, Jillian. I understand that we have possibly a global audience, so let me start off by saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. And hopefully that way I've covered everybody. As you can see from the title, uh, we have called this Solid Phase Extraction 101. So this will be more of an introduction, an elementary overview, but I will provide some uh, useful tips, I think. So let me move on. Certainly, in the world of solid phase extraction, there is a wealth of information. So I will just scratch the surface, but there is a tremendous amount of information that's available. And just as a reference, I've listed two books that I have found to be extremely uh, valuable. The one on the left is entitled Solid Phase Extraction, Principles and Practice by Thurman and Mills. The book in the middle, Solid Phase Extraction, which is edited by Nigel Simpson. And also, when you do a search, you'll find many companies that can provide application notes or more information on their products or solid phase in general. So. Again, the information is there for those who wish to go search for it. This is an outline of the topics that I will be covering. We'll talk about what solid phase extraction is. We'll take a look at the various formats of solid phase, some of the sorbents and the mechanisms used within SPE, some of the required steps. We'll look briefly at some applications to give you a flavor for where this technology is used, and we'll wrap up with a conclusion. So let's first look at what solid phase extraction is. And I will be talking about these particular subsets. We'll provide a definition of solid phase, why is it used, how is it used, a quick look at the history of the SBE technology, and again, some examples that where it's being used now. So a good definition for solid phase extraction is listed here. It is a method of sample preparation that concentrates and purifies analytes from solution by sorption onto a suitable sorbent material, followed by elution of the analyte, or lights, with a solvent that will remove the analytes of interest from the sorbent material. And one of the key words there is concentrates, and we'll come back to that later in the presentation. Solid phase can also be used as a cleanup mechanism, and this is where interferences are retained on the sorbent and the analytes of interest can pass through. 
The mechanisms that are typically used are reverse phase, normal phase, ion exchange, and we'll talk about that a little later. And the main use for SPE is either as a complement or to replace liquid-liquid extraction. So why is it used? Traditionally, traditionally liquid-liquid extraction has been used quite extensively, but it has many disadvantages. It requires large volumes of solvent. It requires cumbersome glassware. You can create an emulsion. And in many cases, it's very difficult to automate. But a key point to keep in mind is liquid-liquid extraction is an equilibrium process. And what that means is that you never achieve complete extraction. And typically, anybody doing it now, you'll find that you're doing multiple extractions. So, and plus, the analytes may exhibit vastly different distribution coefficients between the extracting solvent and the matrix that your sample is in. So the little graph at the bottom right shows you you would be out on the far right where it's static, it's not dynamic, and no matter just letting it sit there, you will not increase the concentration of the analytes in the solvent. I'm sure you've all seen this standard separatory funnel, maybe not as colorful as this. You can do it manually with an operator. You can have an automated shaker. And in order to get around emulsion, some people actually use rollers, which gently, gently spins the bottle. Basically, what we're going to do is you put a solvent into the separatory funnel. And these colors, the blue is the sample matrix, say water. Yellow would be the solvent. Green, the analyte of interest. And when you add the solvent, And then we shake it to mix it. The analytes of interest, which have a greater solubility or partitioning in the solvent, will be pulled into the solvent and we drain it off. And again, because it's an equilibrium process, we do this typically three times, possibly more. Solid phase addresses many of the problems. So with liquid-liquid, we have incomplete phase separation, typically less than quantitative recoveries. Again, expensive or breakable glassware. If you're using a continuous liquid process, it requires a cooling water or electricity. Both of those techniques use great volumes of solvent, which then means you must evaporate great volumes of solvent, which goes up the hood or needs to be recycled. In comparison, solid phase is typically 50 times more efficient than liquid-liquid or continuous in the extraction efficiency. There are many phases that they're to, uh, to choose from. The yields are quantitative, easy to work with, and a key is no emulsions, which means it's typically faster, less solvent is used, labor time is reduced, and the technique is easy to automate. SPE, in comparison, is a non-equilibrium process, which means with the correct sorbent and the amount of the sorbent material, the analytes of interest will be retained or absorbed onto that sorbent material. Another way of looking at SPE is it's a, it's a form of digital LC. It's an on-off mechanism of sorption and desorption. So in comparison, the process is going to pass or filter the sample and analytes through the packing material. And those analytes of interest will be retained or absorbed onto the packing while the sample matrix passes through. And now that we have the analytes of interest, we will introduce the proper eluding solvent. And as that solvent passes through, there's a greater affinity for those analytes in that solvent, and they come off the packing material. And now we have them concentrated in a small volume of solvent. This is just a colorful representation of what is going on. If you start with the three pigments of yellow, red, and blue, and mix them, which forms a black color, 
and then pass them through, in this case, a standard C18 cartridge. You're very e it's very easy to separate the pigments back into the yellow, the red, and the blue. And by changing the eluting strength of the solvent, uh, you get these compounds back off the colors. So how is SPE used? We typically use it to concentrate or trace enrichment. And the reason to do this is to ensure the largest response from the detector system. You want to minimize errors in precision caused by background noise. And three ways to do this is to pass a large volume sample through the smallest bed absorbent to completely retain all the compounds of interest. You then elute that with the smallest volume of solvent possible, and then you elute it with a solvent that's easy to evaporate. So the bottom chromatogram would show you the small trace of the compound of interest, but after using solid phase to concentrate or trace enrichment, you now get a very nice peak, which makes it very easy to quantitate. Another form that SBE is used is cleanup. And this is used to remove interferences before the analytical technique. So the top chromatogram shows you a typical noisy baseline. But after we pass that extract through a cartridge or the SPE sorbent bed, we now have a very clean, flat baseline, again, which makes it very easy to identify and quantitate these compounds of interest. SPE is also used for sample matrix removal or solvent exchange. So you can pour the sample into the SPE sorbent. The analytes of interest come through, but the matrix of the interferences can be retained behind. Again, so you've cleaned up the sample or you can use a different solvent. Just a little history of solid phase. Some scholars claim that the first literature reference is actually found in the Bible in Exodus chapter 15. So it's safe to say that SPE has been around for thousands of years. But as with any science, there's considerable disagreement on who performed the first SPE or who produced the first SPE cartridge. And the term solid phase extraction was only used several years after the technique became available. Looking at a timeline history, this picks up from 1900s. We can look at modern SPE, which really started around the late 70s and continues on. And so in 1978, we saw the first small cartridges used for sample cleanup. We then got into more cartridges for trace enrichment or concentration. And in the late 80s, we saw the advent of SPE disk technology that was introduced by 3M Corporation. And moving out, we see new technology coming, like MIPS. We'll talk about that a little later. And looking at making mixed modal disks in order to capture a full class of compounds, we see that for an 8270 application. And I'll talk about that a little later also. So where is SPE used? This is a fairly recent report that listed SPE by industry. And you can see that pharma takes a major share of the market, followed by academia, hospitals clinical, contract research organizations, and other, which includes the environmental, food and beverages, and other market segments. Now, this is a little polling question. So in, in the next 30 seconds, if you would select what market segment you are involved with today, when this is filled out, we will then actually be able to see the poll, the results of where you're, what industries you're in. So we have environmental, food, pharma, clinical and tox, and other. So please fill that out. And I will advance to the next slide. So here are the results. 23% environmental, 13 food, 
18 pharma, 8.5 clinical and tox, and 37% other. Thank you. So where is it used? Some of you might be using this already. Food and beverages, where we see monitoring of mycotoxins, ag products, beer, wine. State government labs, forensic clinic, criminal labs, academia, pharmaceutical companies, protein purification, drug development, tox labs. An environmental application, extra, extractable hydrocarbons, drugs of abuse, acid-based neutrals in urine for horses, greyhounds, bulls, camels, etc. Food dyes, organic compounds for marine sediments, vitamin D or metabolites, antibiotics in animal feed, organic acid profiles in wine, cryptosporins in blood. So you can see that there's quite a range of applications where SPE is currently being used. So let's take a look at the various formats that we find SPE. We're going to talk about cartridges or syringe barrels, titer plates, pipette tips, dispersive SPE, and we'll spend a little time talking about discs in comparison to cartridges. I think everybody has seen these syringe barrels or cartridges. The picture on the right shows various sizes, from barrels to sealed assemblies with lure fittings top and bottom. But basically, the diagram on the left shows that we take a barrel, we have a frit, bottom and top, and sandwiched between those two frits is the sorbent. Tighter plates where small cartridges are put into the 96 well format. And the diagram on the right just shows a product that 3M developed years ago where a disc is actually sandwiched or held in the bottom of one of these small tubes. And we'll talk about why that can be of a benefit later. Disposable pipette tips where the sorbent is held in the bottom. This technique is a little different in that you pull the sample up and down, so it's an up and down motion versus other SPE is one direction only. But tips can be very useful. We hear a lot about catchers now, and catchers uses or takes advantage of a technique called dispersive SPE. And so these are tubes that have the packing material in it. You pour your sample in, shake it and decant it off, and the SPE does a cleanup technique to clean or remove any interferences from your sample. As you would expect, you can use manual techniques to perform the SPE process. The unit on the right is an automated device from us, which we call our Smart Prep, designed for cartridges only. Discs are the other format of SPE that has come on the scene uh, quite recently. And here we just see different types of discs, a 47 millimeter up to a 100 millimeter. And likewise, you can use a manual process or you can automate. If you look at the diagram in the lower left, a vacuum manifold, those actually are disc holder assemblies that can be used on a standard block manifold. But what's the real difference between a cartridge and a disc? The diagram on the left shows a typical disc, or excuse me, cartridge. The packing material is typically 40 to 60 microns, and you could almost liken that to boulders or rocks in a jar. And if you flow the sample too fast, you'll have channeling, meaning that the sample can pass through without making contact to a particle, which means you will not get the absorption that you're looking for. Discs, on the other hand, typically use 5 to 10 micron particles, and so the picture on the right represents sand. As you pour that same water through, the water cannot make it through without making contact to the sand particles, which means I do not have any breakthrough. This means I can go at a very fast flow rate through a disc. 
So this photo simply shows that if I use a slow controlled flow rate, looking at the cartridge on the left, if I keep the flow to two and a half mils, I have very good retention of this analyte, in this case, the blue food color. But if I go too fast, up to 27 mils per minute, you can see that I'm starting to get the channeling or the breakthrough. Likewise, for the small little sealed assemblies on the right, at 4 mils or 50 mils, but the disc, and this is a 3M disc, you'll see that the blue is retained on the top, but there is no breakthrough. This slide actually shows a better representation. This is a cut side view, and we can see, in this case, it was a red dye, but all of that red dye is retained in the very top portion of the membrane and this membrane is only half a millimeter thick. The reason is that we have very rapid mass transfer or kinetics. And it's best explained this way. In any process, you have a linear velocity versus a flow rate. The higher linear velocities may result in premature breakthrough. But flow rates can be increased by, in by incre keeping the linear velocities low but by increasing the cross-sectional area of the sorbent bed. Thus, a 47 millimeter disc sorbent bed can process large volumes of samples at flow rates up to 200 mils a minute or greater without breakthrough. The reason is that the linear velocity is still moderate, about 1.7 millimeters per second, and this corresponds to a standard HPLC column where its linear velocity is 1.4. So, the disk, because of the larger surface area, allows these faster flow rates to occur, coupled with the small particles that are used, which give us fast kinetics. So the old saying, sometimes big is better, is true when it comes to a disk and its ability. Cartridges, if you go at a slow controlled rate, are good for small volumes or clean samples if they're environmental, whereas a disk is very good for large volume samples or dirty samples. So another polling question, if in the next 30 seconds you would fill out, are you currently using disks, cartridges, dispersion, or plates, that would be appreciated. So let me move on to the next slide. And as we would expect, 77% are currently using cartridges, 13, almost 14% with disks, dispersion 4%, and plates 4%. Thank you for that. I put this in because for those doing environmental work, this is a recent paper that was just published in January by the USGS. And what they're doing is looking at continuous active samplers, comparing it to the passive samplers that have been used, and discrete sample, meaning you take a bottle, you go to the field, and you send it back. The other techniques are actually doing in situ sampling. So let's take a look at some of the sorbents and the mechanisms of SBE. We have silica base, polymer base, carbon, MIPS, which are molecularly imprinted polymers, and immunoaffinity sorbents. So silica just starts with a silica surface, and in this case we have bonded a C8 phase onto it. Again, a wealth of information on the internet, so you can bore down to a deeper level if you wish. Polymers are very popular today, so there is no silica. It is basically aromatic uh, chains held together, and one of the strong reasons to consider using a polymer versus a silica is the impact of pH. So silicas have a range of 2 to 7.5, and above or below this, the bonded phase can be hydrolyzed, cleaved off the surface, and extremely high levels, the silicon can be dissolved. And I just put this question in, if anybody has uh, question at the end, I can explain the case of the disappearing disk. Therefore, polymers can be used at a full pH range, 
plus polymers have the benefit of having about a 15 times greater loading capacity than silica. We have carbon, which is a very good material to use, and there are some specific applications that require this carbon. MIPS is a technology which is fairly new, and what we do is we create a template for the analyte of interest, say a PAH. We take the compounds that we want, we key it into the template, we then hold that template in a structure, and then we remove the template, and now you have a lock and key mechanism whereby when that PAH is found, it can only key into that particular framework. So it's a very specific technique. And immunoaffinity sorbents are also used, and I'll talk a little bit about this later in the presentation. The mechanisms are listed here. As I mentioned, one of the primary techniques is reverse phase. It involves a polar or moderately polar sample matrix in a nonpolar stationary phase. And this would be the C8 or the C18 that we saw before. The retention of the analytes from a polar solution onto the sorbent are due primarily to the attractive forces between a carbon-hydrogen bond between the analyte and the functional groups on the sorbent surface. And a nonpolar solvent will then disrupt these forces between the sorbent and the compound, and that's what we use to elute the analytes of interest. The other commonly used technique is a normal phase. So this involves a polar analyte, a mid to nonpolar matrix, such as an acetone, chlorinated solvent, hexane, and a polar sorbent. The retention is primarily due to interactions between the polar functional groups and the polar groups on the sorbent. And the interactions are typically hydrogen bonding and pi-pi interactions. Ion exchange is the third technique and we can have anionic, cationic, and the retention is primarily due to an electrostatic attraction of the charge functional group in the compound to the charge group that is bonded to the silica surface. So when you go online and look for information, you'll find things like this, that you can find what your sample matrix is, aqueous or organic, and then it will help you determine should you be using reverse phase, ion exchange, or a normal phase. And then it will help you identify the actual packing material that would be most suited for your work. Likewise, another web search, this just shows you from EPA methods, the type of sample, drinking water, wastewater, the class of compounds, and the material, the, the packing that should be used. Again, looking at information online a little differently. Here we can break it down by the interaction, the mechanisms, reverse phase, normal phase, ionic. Or we can look at information and break it down by the class, pharmaceutical, food and beverage. So there are many ways that you can find the information you're looking for to find which packing you should be using for the applications you're dealing with. So let's look at the required steps for SPE. So we'll look at the operations and the steps for method development. By now it should be pretty clear that the first thing we need to do is condition the sorbent material. So we will add an organic solvent and pass it through and take that to waste. And the main reason we're doing that is we want to condition the packing, in this case, a C18. The top of this diagram shows what a normal C18 is like if it is not activated. It's collapsed on itself, it's not receptive. And so if you pass your sample through before conditioning the cartridge, you will not get very good retention or basically concentration. Uh, this is also why you hear the critical importance of keeping the C18 wet for the entire time that you process your sample. The bottom diagram shows what the C18 would look like once it's completely conditioned or activated. 
Once the cartridge or the disc or whatever mechanism is conditioned, we load the sample. You could then use a wash step to remove any in interfering materials. And lastly, we will find a solvent that will elute those analytes of interest off of that packing material and into our collection vessel. So it's a very straightforward process. For method development, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. As Jillian mentioned, it will be available on the CNE website. This will also be posted on the Horizon site. But basically what you need to do is classify the analytes, which means understand the chemical class, the solubility, the polarity, the charge, stability, and concentration. Once you identify the analytes and you understand the characteristics, classify the sample matrix. Is it a solid, a gas, a liquid? What impurities do you need to worry about? You need to determine the analytical technique. What are the detection limits that you're looking for? What eluting solvents might have restrictions or requirements for the analytical technique you're using? What about purity of those solvents? And what about the, an the analyte concentration? You need to determine the extraction mechanism, again, based on the class or the sample matrix, or do you need to do any post-extraction sample manipulation, like a derivatization or an evaporation? Again, what analytical technique are you going to use, a GC or an LC, reverse phase, normal phase, ion exchange? Choose the sorbent chemistry. So select the purity of the target analytes and the overall specificity. What about the recovery that you're looking for, retention without breakthrough? Consider the sample matrix volume. Is it a small sample, large volume? What are the concentrations? Does the sorbent have the capacity if you're passing a full liter sample through? What's the elution volume that you need? And again, the analytical detection. Choose the sorbent mass, the capacity or the sample loading. Again, consider the recovery and the final elution volume and detection limits that you're looking for. Choose the configuration or cartridge column size. Is it a cartridge, a tighter plate, pipette tip? Is it a disc? The tube size with sample volumes. And optimize sample matrix preparation. Again, see above for the dilution or any pretreatment to remove impurities, hydrolysis, analytical detection. And then optimizing wash conditions or optimizing elution and analyze and quantitate. I realize that's a lot of information to cover, but it's available online, uh, so there's a wealth of information to help you develop your methods. So looking at some of the typical applications in a little more detail, we're going to take a look at food and beverages, drugs of abuse, and an EPA method 8270. So again, just as an example for food and beverages, we all have heard enough about pesticides and herbicides and how they're used to increase the food supply, but these compounds can be quite toxic, they're quite ubiquitous in nature, and they can wind up getting onto the food or staying on the food that we eat or getting into the drinking water that we consume. So where solid phase can be used quite successfully, in this case, a determination of phenylurea herbicides in tap water and the tap water that's used to make soft drinks. And so we find, unfortunately, that in various parts of the world, these phenylurea herbicides, which are sprayed in the field, wind their way into the drinking water, which then be get, become used and present in soft drink sodas. I mentioned mycotoxins earlier. These are naturally occurring molds or funguses. You, f you hear about aflatoxins, citronin, oquatoxin, and these are some very carcinogenic materials that are resisting decomposition or they get broken down in digestion and remain in the food chain. And you typically find these in things like peanut butter or corn and other food products. This is a slide I mentioned before. The slide on the left is a typical 
immuno affinity cartridge column. And the difference it has, it has a PSA buffer that must remain in that cartridge. And when you look at the lower left, you'll see the gel held between two frits. If the gel is able to dry out, the cartridge in the right, which has no buffer in it, you'll see that it is contracted. So this cartridge comes with a cap, top and bottom, and the assembly on the right shows a plunger assembly that has a needle at the bottom. So the needle will pierce the top of that cap, not allow that buffer to rain, drain out, but more importantly, it does not drive the plunger down into that gel, which is very soft and would be crushed and would not be l allowing that cartridge to be used for the application. So this process can be automated for those who have an interest. Drugs of abuse is very popular and commonly used for SPE. So this is just an application note on drugs of abuse in urine. Uh, again, a lot of information online that can help you if this is your area of, of interest. Personal care products is a big concern to many people. This is some work done by Ferrer and Thurman, and these were using one liter samples with a disc. And again, so it took 20 minutes to process this sample through, and a disc makes sense because at that large volume and the time and the benefits discs provide, a cartridge could be used, but it would just take you much longer to handle that sample. The last application I'll talk about is EPA method 8270. Uh, this is a very interesting method in that there are 240 compounds with a full range of analytes. This is only a, a handful of what you find in the actual sample or what you're looking for. But as a comparison, this is what a typical liquid-liquid extraction recovery would look like. And this method allows recovery windows of 30% to 130 because, again, it's a very difficult class of compounds to capture. And you'll see that many of these compounds are outside of the lower 30% window. But using solid phase extraction, and this is a modified disc in that it has a polymeric material. It also has an ion exchange material. And we also use a carbon cartridge. And so the red is the polymeric recovery. The blue are the ion exchange recoveries. And the black are the carbon. So you can see from the previous slide where we had very low or random recoveries, solid phase with a mixed modal phase is able to do a very good job of handling a one liter sample and greatly improving the recoveries for these compounds. So wrapping up with a conclusion, SPE solves many problems associated with liquid-liquid. SPE is about 50 times more efficient in the extraction compared to the liquid-liquid. It can be used as a concentration or trace enrichment te technique. It can be used for sample cleanup and or matrix re removal. It also allows fractionation to be very easily done, so you can collect different classes of compounds. There are many, many sorbents available on the market. There are various formats that can be used. You can handle a wide range of sample volumes, cartridges being small volumes to clean samples, and discs for large volumes or dirty samples. And because this technique is very friendly, user friendly, it can be easily automated. So with that, we can open it up for any questions. All right. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Um, I will remind our listeners that you can ask questions using the Q&A box on your screen. We have several in already, so we'll go ahead and get started. But feel free to submit more. Um, the first question I'll ask, uh, ask, can you get, comparing disks versus cartridges, can you get the same retention through a thin disk as you can using a cartridge? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, yes, you can. Uh, 
it depends certainly on the class of compounds that you're trying to capture. Again, the disc have a benefit of small particles, so they have higher kinetics. You can maintain the fast flow rates. But when we do studies, we find that if we do have breakthrough, we, we can add more material, or you could stack two discs together. And the same would occur with a cartridge. If you get breakthrough, you could use a larger cartridge or add more packing material to it. All right, and can you distinguish how SPE is different from column liquid chromatography, and what are, when would you choose to use SPE over LC? Uh, column liquid chromatography, if, if I understand what you're asking, would, would be very, very similar. If, uh, if, if you're putting a column, say, with fluorosil or a silica, uh, that would be a cleanup technique where the sample is added or the extract is added and you're removing possibly some impurities. So I, I will interpret that that they're really the same technique. Are, are there situations in which SPE would be better than LC? Oh, I'm sorry, LC. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, well, LC is certainly an analytical instrument. so. The, set, the SPE would be used prior to the LC, either for trace enrichment, concentration, or the sample cleanup. But the technique that's going on inside the LC is, is basically the same in that based on the affinity, affinity of the analyte and the mobile phase that's being used, you simply start resolving those analytes into the discrete analyte so the detector at the back end can quantitate it. And is it possible to use SPE uh, to concentrate or enrich a, a trace analyte um, and then run the sample using something like FTIR or Raman? Yes. Yes. That's typically why the SPE is used for that concentration or trace enrichment mode. Uh, from the Star Trek days, the tricorder has not been developed yet that can shoot at a beam and tell us everything we want to know about that sample. So until that day occurs, we do need to, in many cases, concentrate the extract down so we do have the sensitivity on the detector on the back end. Um, we have one uh, person asking, if your initial sample is in water, how would you dry the SCE cartridge prior to eluding with a solvent? Uh, very good question. Uh, the thing that you have to be careful of, many people think that they need to dry completely before eluding it with a solvent. If your analytes are stable enough or they do not volatize, that can work very well. You could take a cartridge and pass nitrogen through it. If you're working with environmental samples which are water-soluble or very volatile, by trying to dry the sorbent bed, you run the risk of either oxidizing if you use air or you can volatilize the compounds off. And so you'll wind up with lower recoveries. Uh, we have another technique where we actually leave the bed wet and we use a water-soluble solvent, like a methanol, an acetone, an ethyl acetate, and after the water has gone through, we immediately hit it with that water-soluble solvent and we take that off and then follow it with a hexane or a uh, methylene chloride and then we have a technique, other than sodium sulfate, it's a hydrophobic membrane, where the water is retained, but the solvent will pass through. So we're able to dry that extract very easily. But we do that in order to achieve higher and more consistent recoveries in the analytes of interest. We have a question here um, regarding metabolomics research using LCMS. Uh, particularly QTOF, most researchers advise against the use of SPE for preparation or concentration of samples. What is your experience in this area? Uh, I have no direct experience in that area myself, so I, I, unfortunately I cannot answer that question. All right. We have a few questions on <coughs> industrial scale applications of SPE. Um, one is a, a general question. What industrial scale applications are, are you familiar with? Myself, uh, only from the literature, not having 
no direct hands-on experience, but you do find many people that will scale up, say, a, a pilot run from a research into a large scale where it's very similar. You'll have packing material in there, and what you're trying to do is remove impurities or uh, make your final product safe for the end user consumer. Again, probably the best thing is an internet search to see what the current or the best technology is for that industry. Are you familiar with any of the, the challenges involved in scale up? I myself am not, no. Okay. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in, so uh, thank you to our listeners for, for being so active. Uh, one question is, are there uses of SCE for extraction of organophosphorus compounds? And I reference specifically method 1667. Yes, um, 1667? Uh, 1657. 1657. Okay, then that would be a standard EPA method. So yes, uh, the phosphates are a normal class of compounds, again, with the right phase, uh, the right loading capacity, knowing the analytes of interest. Uh, most of these are fairly water soluble, so it would most likely be a polymeric type material. It might be a mixed phase also, like the 8270, uh, but it would be a very straightforward technique to do. Are solid phases stable over long periods of time, or do people need to worry about degradation, or in particular degradation products that might interfere with analysis? Uh, good question. No, they're, they're quite stable, and w one of the uh, slides that I showed where it was the cartridge with the preconditioning, loading, washing, and looting. The other thing that you're doing when you precondition a cartridge or a disc is that solvent, you typically, whatever solvent you use on the back end to extract the cartridge or disc, if you use that on the front end as well, that solvent will remove any manufacturing impurities or anything that might be on that sorbent bed. So you're basically cleaning up that sorbent before you actually load it on your sample. So it doesn't matter how long that sorbent bed has been sitting on a shelf, because right before you load your sample, you're going to clean it up. Now, beyond XAD resins, uh, can, do you have any suggestions for low-cost bulk RP resins? Most of them are pretty reasonable, I'll say. Uh, the XADs, I've used that in the past, work very well, but very hard to get it clean. But any of your polymers today will do an excellent job. Uh, again, doing a liter literature search, you have all types of functional functionality that can be added onto the polymer to give it a hydrophilic, lipophilic balance. Um, the HLBs are, are well known now. So there are many good phases that are available. Again, look at the class of compounds you're looking for and pick the right phase that will retain them on the, on the surface. Are sorbents available for selectively absorbing chiral analytes? Chiral? Yes. I believe there are. Again, I would defer to a search um, and see what you find. Are the question is, are any SPEs reusable? I assume this is more, are the, the disks or cartridges reusable, or, or are they all disposable? Well, that really is, a, it depends on who you talk to. Um, it, again, depends if it's a very dirty sample that you're processing, you probably want to dispose of it. If it's a fairly clean sample or even a blank or a spike, in a sense, it's just like your HPLC column. You can regenerate it or you can clean it up and use it again. But I would say the number of times you use it should be up or the end user needs to make that determination. Are there is there a type or types of cartridges you would recommend for biogenic amine concentration from a polar matrix? Again, I, I think the, the information is online somewhere by going to uh, the companies that provide these packing materials and looking into their application notes or talking with some of their, their chemists to get specific uh, information for that, that application. Um, is there a... This method that 
filters out phosphates and will leave behind most pharmaceutical analytes. Eliminates phosphates? Yes. I'm sh possibly. I've not done that work myself. Um, but if somebody wanted to send me a direct email, we can. I can certainly look into that application. Okay. Um, would you recommend discs for plasma samples with less than one milliliter of sample volume? Well, that's a great question. Um, one of the benefits the disc has, again, and that's why I put that tighter plate diagram in, that that's a very, very small disc. Uh, I think hopefully you saw the benefit of a disc over a cartridge because of linear velocity versus flow rate versus kinetics. So it's very easy to make a smaller disc as long as it has the loading capacity. So in that case, yes, a disc of that size would be a very nice uh, way to handle a one mil blood sample. Um, can SPE be used for fractionation of an extract in organic solvent? Yes. Yes. And All you need to do is just understand the retention of the analytes. What, if you're trying to collect different fractions, um, say aromatics from aliphatics, you just know what the breakthrough point is, and then you switch to a different solvent. And if you do it automatically, it's very easy because then the cartridge is just moved over another tube, the next tube, and you elude into the, the next tube and so on. Um, is it possible to use SPE discs in the field, such as for water extraction, and then store the discs for days to weeks before actually eluding uh, the material? Yes. That paper that was from the USGS, that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, the whole concept is taking, let me put it this way, why send a one liter sample from the field to the lab when you can take the disc to the field, do the extraction there, and here, that work was actually running, ranging between 20 to 100 liters of sample, I believe. And it's pulled through in real time. The disk is then, it's in a, in a sealed assembly. It's capped. It's sent back to the laboratory, and it's extracted in the field. Uh, just a, an example where that technology is used, the, no association with us, the Horizon oil platform that exploded in the Gulf. I believe that was five miles down. And that same disk assembly was sent down five miles to pull a sample, a seawater sample, looking for what is still coming out of that wellhead. Are there SPE materials that are resistant to de-wetting phase collapse, like some of the latest C18 HPLC chemistry? The polymers would be much, much better than that. I don't know the LC market that well and what the different columns are that they're using. Uh, but a C18, if it does dry, it will collapse. Uh, you'd have to talk to the suppliers of those materials and really see if they have something in their arsenal that would work. All right, uh, next question. Does your mobile phase for SPE need to be liquid, or can you use SPE for, with gas as your mobile phase akin to a, a GC line? Um, you could use a gas, certainly, if you go back to the um, hygienic uses. Those were carbon tubes, if you will, and you're pulling, in that case, a little vacuum pump on the back end, so you're pulling the room air in because you're looking at what volatiles are in a workspace. So yes, uh, it would certainly work, again, based on what analytes you're looking for. Then you select the right phase in order to trap or capture those analytes. Um, there's one person asking whether there are SPE devices for performing metal speciation. There are. There's uh, actually, you can make a chelating disc, and again, you have the same benefit. Uh, these discs will capture the transition metals, and so if you look at, you buy an ICP, what do you need in order to get more sensitivity, a mass spec? That gets to be a pretty expensive uh, purchase, but
but if you concentrate the sample down using a chelating disc, you'll gain the sensitivity and could just see it on a standard ICP. So yes, that has been done and there are discs available. One, liner, one listener asks uh, or comments that you know, chemicals can leach from the plastic cartridge contaminating the sample. What SPE technique would be the cleanest technique to use from that perspective? Uh, from our experience, uh, I'll just speak from the environmental side because we do look at trace levels. And as long as the cartridge is cleaned, again, during that conditioning or, or activation step, any phthalates or plasticizers uh, typically are removed. They're not, the surface is cleaned. So by the time you pass your sample through, you will not have a problem. If you're doing something different, there are glass barrels available. And that would solve the problem of any leachables coming from a plastic. Uh, another listener asks whether there is such a thing as SPE for selective retention of cells with particular cell surface proteins or carbohydrate epitopes? Boy, that's um, not sure. I would hope so, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not sure. All right. We are almost out of time, so I'm going to ask a couple more questions, uh, and then we'll, we will wrap up. Um, is it possible to condition a cartridge one day before the extraction, uh, keeping the sorbent in water or presumably another solvent, and in the fridge, will the sorbent stay active? Well, that's a good one. Uh, I would hope so, because if you condition it with, say, methanol, cap it, put it aside, nothing should happen to that bed. So if you then come back the next day and use it, I would think you should be in good shape. All right, one final question to wrap up. Uh, SPE has been around for 40 years. What, what do you see ahead in the future for the technique? Well, I'll be real honest. If I knew the answer, I'd be on an island somewhere with my drink because uh, nobody can ever predict the future. But I think it's safe to say that we're seeing a, 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 a branch, if you will, for large volume samples and small samples. And as we look at the packing materials that are coming out, some of the questions I think were, were going along that line. As, new, as the science advances where we need to look at particular compounds or classes of compounds, the science is there to develop the bright packings, be it a MIPS. Uh, or a special sorbent that will capture these compounds and allow us to see uh, new compounds or even lower detections or, or gain enhanced selectivity uh, to make our life just that much easier. All right, that is all the time we have. Thank you again, Bob, for your presentation. Thank you, participants, for being a terrific audience. And I, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions. We just ran out of time. Be sure to check CNEN or CNEN online for information on the next edition of CNEN webinars. Thank you ON24 for technology and production services. And finally, thank you Horizon Technology for the sponsorship that made this webcast possible. For CNEN webinars, I'm Jillian Kemsley. Goodbye.